Okay, so hey everybody, welcome back to the Visually Hidden Podcast. My name's Peter O'Brien, and of course with me again today is Mr. Stephen Bendler. Hello. And joining us from Paris, France is the lovely Miss Anne Milville. Bonjour. Hi. <laughs> okay, so this is our second episode, and to just recap really quickly, last week was our first episode. We talked a bit about independent filmmaking and how a lot of filmmakers begin their careers with horror, which led us down the dark road of horror. And we talked extensively about several films. If you would like to hear those comments, please go check out that first episode because we're not going to repeat everything. We got new stuff to talk about today. But if you're interested and you're just catching this right now, we talked about Duel from 1971, The Wraith from 1986, Rope from 1948, and then we discussed several wild cards, including 10 Cloverfield Lane, Smile, and Dogman. Then we continued with Dead Alive, aka Brain Dead from 1992, and finally Barbarian from 2022. Okay, so if you are if you are interested in what we had to say about those films, please check out that first episode. In addition to that, as I said, we talked about horror and independent filmmaking because they kind of go hand in hand. A lot of filmmaking careers begin in the horror genre. It's just the way it goes. I'd like to just follow up on that a little bit this week with some of our own experiences here. So last week, I had mentioned that Steve and I actually met while working on a horror film a short film called Strange Aeons based out of uh, H.P. Lovecraft, I guess, folklore. And Steve, we mentioned it, but we didn't really talk too much about it. Do you remember? What's your experience from getting involved in the project? Do you have any other like anecdotes or experiences that you remember that you can recall? What do you got? What's, uh, give, us, give us a Strange Aeons throwback. That was a really fun time for me because I had known Ray a while, but I met you. I met, you know, uh, Jim and a couple of the other guys on the film. So that was really cool. I think the one night that stands out the most was when we were filming in that the office where we're, I, I don't remember where the location was. We were like I in believe the middle it of was the up in Spring Valley, New York. So yeah, we drove from, from Pelham Bay area of the Bronx all the way up to Rockland County and a town called Spring Valley, which is not the nicest neighborhood. Um, I mean, it has it has its moments, but to be driving around there in the middle of the night, it's not the greatest idea. Yeah, but we were we were locked in like a, a little kind of trailer office building, so we were kind of concealed. So this is what I remember from that night, and you can correct me if if any of this comes off as inaccurate. But I remember that specific night. When we pulled up to that building, it was the, a wild experience because I think on the premises somewhere, there was a tank parked outside, if I remember correctly. Like So like one <laughs> side of the building, there's a tank. And then on the other side of the building, under the one street lamp, there was like prostitutes. And I'm like, this is a pretty interesting atmosphere. And then we go into the building and I'm like, all right, cool. This is this is it, right? This is indie filmmaking at its finest. And I'm just roaming around the building. And I remember seeing like a blood smear on the wall <laughs> or what we thought was a blood smear and i'm like okay this is this is good for the ambiance mm. and then we found a door i don't know if you remember the door i don't think i remember the door yeah we opened the door and it was just complete blackness and i'm like <laughs> absolutely not and just shut <laughs> that door like what no one's going in like and we're just looking at each other like anyone want to like no I've seen that movie before. Mm -hmm. No one's going through that door. I mean, it was just like the blackest of black. You couldn't see a hint of anything in that room or dungeon or whatever it was. So between the blood smear, the tank, the prostitutes, and the, the gaping void behind that door, I was like, I'm just going to stay by the camera and the lights just in case anything happens. But that was a pretty unique experience. It it really was. And it is kind of a, um, a testament to the whole independent film approach. You know, you kind of take what you can get. And that was the experience. I do remember the tank and the prostitutes. How could you forget? I mean, now that you mention it, I do remember the black void. But I my memories of that are a little bit different. What I remember most about that, aside from actual filming, 
coincidentally, the scene we're talking about is actually the one featured in Misery Loves Company. So if you're curious and you want to see what this office experience was like, the result of it is in Misery Loves Company. And it's during the uh, the black and white film segment when Brian is watching the movie. He projects himself and his friend Cliff into the film setting. I remember driving up to the location. We had driven down to the Bronx to bring equipment and you guys up there. And Steve got into the car with me and we drove up there together. That was where Steve and I really kind of bonded because we had like an hour just to ourselves sitting in the car. And we were talking about everything from like Prince to movies we liked. And it was just a really, really strong like friendship building experience. And then we went through the filming process, which is a whole other kind of friendship and relationship building experience. Um, We had been filming on and off weekends for a little bit at this point. And this was kind of like our big kind of production night um, because we were like the big excursion. Yeah, we were we were on location, as they say. We weren't in the uh, the little studio space next door where we would just move Jimmy's furniture around and film in his basement. Yeah. Which was fun. Yeah, it's always it's always fun to just take a space and then make it into something else. I mean, I have I can't even tell you how many times I've like repurposed rooms in my house to be, you know, just a little corner set in something or a location and you just tie it together in the editing process. It's really a lot of fun, you know, when you um, start to think about like what's possible and what you can achieve with what you have, you know, working within your means. And that's really kind of the essence of low budget and independent filmmaking. It's like everybody thinks you have to have all this money and build all these sets and be very elaborate. And in reality, you just have to kind of assess it, make a list of your assets, really. Like at the end of The Princess Mm -hmm. Bride, you know, like, what are our liabilities? And we have a cart and we have a cloak and we have (laughs) you know, a giant. Okay, let's go storm the castle. And that's really the approach you need to take. It's like you just got to do an inventory. Okay, what do we have access to? What are our assets? And then you just try to utilize them to the best of your ability. And I always say that limitation inspires creativity. Absolutely. It's like you want that location, but you can't have that location. So what can you do to achieve that location? Yeah. And that's where you start to really get the creative ideas flowing. And then, uh, you you know, you can involve your cast or your crew to get their ideas and brainstorm. And then it becomes a, a collaboration of sorts. One of the earlier scenes, we were in Ray's workplace, I believe, using his office and I'm on the phone with your character. And he wanted to get this shot where the camera was like the, the POV of the base of the receiver. So the phone would essentially come down and the phone would cover the, the lens and then cut. It would not work because the phone was too narrow. Ray was getting really annoyed because he really wanted that shot. And I was just sitting there as just like, how can I help this guy? Oh, here's a really big stapler. So for that one part, one of my hands coming down, it's not a phone, it's a stapler, but the stapler base was wide enough to cover the lens and he got the shot. And I was like, all right, but stuff like that, it's kind of invaluable when you think about it. And and again, it's it's always like experience, you know, like you don't know until you're there. Like you, you didn't learn that in a classroom. You learn that from being on the set. After we finished the film and it was in the uh, Lovecraft Film Festival in Oregon, we flew out there and I remember Steve and I, we like, went out on kind of like a mandate to the video <laughs> store. We just walked around the uh, the video store, just looking at like boxes on the shelves and just pointing like, mm-hmm. have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? We spent like maybe an hour in the horror section, just kind of picking each other's brains and experiences. <laughs> Our relationship is like rooted so deeply in horror, which is really funny because we're not We're not super duper horror guys, but that's where we begin is, you know, in the horror tree. Coincidentally, the only films that Steve and I have actually seen together in the movie theater have been horror double features. Mm -hmm. We went to see Evil (laughs) Dead and Night of the Living Dead at the Two Boots Theater in Manhattan. And then we went to see Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein at a theater in Danbury, Connecticut. And those are the only times I've been to the movies with Steve. Yeah, that's true. Except for when our films have been showing, whenever there was a screening of Misery Loves Company, or uh, we did another short film called Trick or Treat. Trick or Treat is a three-minute short film that we did shortly after filming Misery Loves Company. It's based on a microfiction that I had written. That fiction was 
featured on a, uh, I guess, a literary blog of sorts, but it's no longer available there. So if you're interested in the original short story, send us an email and I'll send you back a copy of it. But the film, it's only three minutes. It's very, very tight. It's mostly voiceover narration. We filmed it pretty much in one night. Uh, in Yonkers at Steve's mm-hmm. old house. And then we did a couple of pickup shots back in Congers, New York, where I was living at the time. We uh, we premiered it and all this happened about 12 years ago. And it since went into a few festivals. It was in the famous Monsters Film Festival in uh, San Jose, California. It was at the Nyack Film Festival in New York. A couple of others over the years, I think it was in the Troma Dance Film Festival in Michigan. So it's it's gotten around, but now it resides safely and securely on the Visually Hidden YouTube channel. So if anybody's interested in checking out Trick or Treat, you can simply go to YouTube, search Visually Hidden, and check out our channel, and you'll find a plethora of our creative works, including the three-minute short Trick or Treat, which we're talking about. What are your recollections of Trick or Treat, Steve? And then we'll we'll jump into the, uh, the meat of this episode. Man, that was so much fun. It, it, it couldn't have been easier for me because we just majority of it was filmed at my house. And you weren't there. However, you were in the film class I was running at that time. And that's kind of what inspired me to focus more on filmmaking because I was teaching all of you guys about filmmaking and I saw how much fun you guys were having with it. I was like, I want to have fun too, but I can't do their project <laughs> for them. Let me get my own project going. And so then I decided that summer I wasn't going to teach. I was going to film. And then in the fall, we did that, but I believe you had already gone on with your life. So you've uh, you've seen Trick or Treat. What are your thoughts without spoiling it too much? It's scary. It's perfect. It's a perfect short film for Halloween. Um, you know, I don't really like horror movies, so uh, uh, I'm easily freaked out, <laughs> so <laughs> I must admit. But I'm, I'm glad to hear that I kind of inspired you on that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great short uh, film for horror fans. Yeah, it's definitely not for everybody. There's one specific instance in there that may upset some people. <laughs> but for the most part, if you're a horror fan, as a horror fan, and Steve as a horror fan, we thought this was just going to be a lot of fun. And it was well received by the horror community. So again, trick or treat, visually hidden, YouTube, check it out. Let us know what you think. On that note, I guess we should just kind of jump into this week's event. So we have been doing a series called Shocktober. It's a monthly long program of 31 horror films. So if you go to the Visually Hidden Instagram page, you can find the entire calendar posted there. It's also available on the Facebook page for Visually Hidden. And I invite Steve and Anne to specifically join me on this adventure so we could discuss it on this podcast. And as I said, last week, we talked about the first seven films. Uh, This week, we have a whole new batch of films that include Dark City from 1998, The Black Phone from, I believe, 2021? Yeah, 2021, I believe. The Sentinel from 1977, The Ninth Configuration from 1980, The Babadook from 2014, and we also took a look at the new Peacock series, Suburban Screams, because it's produced by John Carpenter, and we're going to talk a little bit more extensively about him because Suburban Screams was not yet available in Europe, so Anne has some alternative programming for us. And of course, we followed it all up with a board game night or an alien night. So we'll be talking about the alien franchise a little bit as well. So let's just jump right into it. Okay. And you got to see Dark City. What do you think? I think you, you're you not going to like uh, what I'm going to say, but uh, it's quite an unpopular opinion I have. <laughs> I didn't I didn't make the movie, so I'm not going to be offended. However, first, I want to clarify, I saw the director's cut, which is an hour and 50 minutes, and I believe it's very different from the theatrical cut, which is an hour and 40 minutes. Do you know which version you watched? Oh, I think I, I, I saw the regular one, uh, not the director's cut. Okay, so then that may also affect your perception of the film and your experience with the film. So, all right, what do you got? Dark City. First of all, I didn't know about this movie before. So when I went to the DVD rental company, you know, I when I asked for it, the the employee was so enthusiastic about it. <laughs> he told me it's like the pre-Matrix movie 
So I was uh, expecting something really huge. I love Matrix. So, so maybe that's why I didn't really like it. Um, really, I, th I think the, the makeup is quite bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I know people will hate me for what I'm going to say. But yeah, the, the special effects, I, I wasn't really convinced. Convinced. Um, for me, Mary Poppins in the 60s was better. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really mean. I'm sorry, but really, I was really surprised. And, 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 and the guy told me that apparently the post-production was two years. And I was surprised because really the, the, social, uh, the, the, the special effects were, were really bad for me. But apart from that, I would say that Jennifer Connelly is really good in it. Um, I love this actress. I think she really did the job in the in the movie and the best line of the movie is from her i would say uh, when she says i love you but this can be fake i don't know if you remember this part but um yeah i i, I think that the story is super complex to understand maybe because i'm a <laughs> i'm a little bit stupid maybe but i didn't really get it uh, so maybe you can explain to me uh, pete because um they, they try to explain uh, the the atmosphere at the beginning with a very long narrative moment but I didn't really get it. And one hour after the begin, you have Kiefer Sutherland making like a monologue to explain more, but it's still confused for me. I didn't get much of it. So yeah, I didn't like it. Even the end is disappointing. Yeah, I, I, I really, I, I don't have many good things to say about this movie. I'm sorry. That's fine. That's your opinion and it's cool. And yeah, that's where the... Um the experience with the different versions comes into play. I watched the director's cut, which does not have that opening narration. It just kind of jumps in with oh. both feet and gives the audience a little bit of credit to keep up. And yeah, this movie is definitely not for everyone. It is very cerebral. While I was watching it, I had never seen it before. I remember when it came out in 1998 and people were kind of talking about it a little bit, but then it just kind of went away and it kind of became this like cult sleeper type of movie. I do believe it was uh, surpassed by films like The Matrix, um, your video store guy. He's right on point. While I was watching this film, I was like, wow, this is this is kind of like The Matrix before The Matrix. And my final summation of this film is that it is like The Matrix meets Labyrinth, which coincidentally stars Jennifer Connelly. So woohoo! <laughs> But yeah, it has a very, very uh, strong cerebral thematical story foundation. Like you really have to pay attention to the film. And I strongly recommend the director's cut simply because you get a little bit more of what the director intended. But, but what the aim of the movie, I, I didn't get it. Right. I'm getting there. The studio went to him and said, listen, you have to dumb this down. You have to dumb this movie down for, for general audiences. Not everybody is going to get this movie. And reluctantly, they made the changes, and which is why he eventually released a director's cut, because not everybody is going to like every movie. Not everybody is going to care about every movie, and not everybody is going to understand every movie. And you shouldn't necessarily have to compromise your art. However, when it's the studio's dime, they have quite a say. So... The uh, thing with the movie, though, is that the uh, beings, what are they, the uh, the strangers? Yeah, the, the strangers, yeah, I think. They're aliens, and they have basically taken this community of people and are running experiments on them to better understand human beings and the human soul and what drives us as a uh, being. So they keep us in this city of perpetual night, floating through space and it's a very very deep movie um and basically the main character he's basically neo he's the guy who wakes up from under their spell and starts to figure things out and realizes that he can control situations with his mind it's almost too complex to summarize <laughs> but the best summary i can offer is it's the matrix meets labyrinth of course, The Matrix, I don't want to say it's dumbed down, but you basically have Morpheus explaining everything to Neo, who is the audience, throughout the first half of the film. So The Matrix is a lot more digestible. It's a lot more polished. Of course, it has um, some slightly bigger names in it with Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne. It's, it's no mystery why it was 
better accepted. Of course, they were in production around the same time. So it's merely coincidence that they existed, you know, overlapping like that. I could very easily see how people who like horror would like it because, again, it has a lot of dark themes. It has a dark setting. It has dark elements. So I personally, I enjoyed it. But again, I saw the director's cut. It could be a totally different experience watching the theatrical cut. Yeah, probably. But really, I I don't know. I, I didn't get it, really. Maybe I'm... I, as I said, maybe I'm I'm too stupid for those kind of movies, but but you know when we compare with Matrix, I I think Matrix is a complex movie too, but things are explained step by step. This movie, as I said, you have what I I saw is you have the narrative explanation at the beginning, which confuses you more than anything, and then the story starts, but you don't really get it, and. What I said, an hour after the beginning, you have Kiefer Sutherland explaining things that you didn't ask for, <laughs> and it confuses you more. So, and and you still have some questions. And that's what I'm saying. I believe that you know, if you watch the director's cut, you may have a totally mm -hmm. different experience with this film in terms of the presentation of the information the way it's structured, the way it's laid out, and the way it's executed. I know that with the director's cut. Again, it's 10 minutes longer. They removed some things like Kiefer Sutherland's narration. They redid some special effects so things look a little bit better. So if it's renting space in your head, you may want to check out the director's cut. I'm not saying go out and rent it or buy it right now. But down the line, you know, if you're at a friend's house and you see like the director's cut on their shelf, it's like, oh, can I borrow this? I wanted to check that out because I saw the theatrical and it was really kind of annoying and tedious. So I personally, I love when there's an alternate cut of a film. I actually enjoy watching that, you know, just from an editing standpoint, what is possible with the source material? You know, sometimes you'll see there's an extended cut um, or sometimes there's a director's cut and sometimes the director's cut is even shorter than the actual film. Okay. You know, because the studio wants certain things in there and the director's like, no, I, we don't need that. I don't want to shoot that additional stuff. And so you get different experiences with different cuts. And sometimes one scene can change an entire movie or an entire story. I just wanted to say that I think I'm also disappointed about this movie because I, I knew it was a movie of Alex Pro, pro yes, I don't know how you said. Uh, and um, yeah, I knew he, he did the the crow, but he also did. I think I'm not sure, but I think he did Gods of Egypt, and I really loved this movie. Uh, so I I was really expecting something. You know, the the guy told me that it's a pre matrix. I saw it's an Alex Proyas movie. I was really expecting some something that I didn't get in that movie. That's why I think I'm so disappointed about it. He did The Crow in 94 and then Dark City in 98. So those two are back to back. Yeah. And you can you can definitely see visual aesthetics that cross between them just with the, the cinematography and the production design as well. There's a little bit of overlap between those two films. And I think they are a visual companion, especially to that point in his career. Like last week, we were talking about Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson and kind of segments of their career that that started with horror and the influence of the cross-pollination of those particular projects and i feel like yeah the crow and dark city for alex proyas are definitely in that same kind of category because prior to that he had mostly been doing music videos and he segued into feature films and they are very stylized if nothing else yeah the, well the crow does feel like one giant like badass music video so it really really does with like a, yeah. like the coolest rock star in the world in Brandon Lee. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> so after Dark City, we watched The Black Phone, which is a newer film from 2021. And I had not seen anything for this. I saw like the tile on the streaming service. I saw the title, but I never watched a trailer. I had no idea what the premise was. I knew that Ethan Hawke was in it because his name was on the poster that I saw. But other than that, I went into this one blind and uh, I enjoyed it. I thought that it was a little derivative 
of Stephen King, but of course it was written by Joe Hill, who is the son of Stephen King, literally. He's the little boy in Creepshow, actually, Creepshow. with the voodoo doll. That's that's the author of The Black Phone. And I mean, it's got to be tough, you know, living in the shadow of that man. But at the same time, you could utilize your talents and skills to maybe make your own, your own name in the world. You don't necessarily have to, um, you know, live on the same street as your pops. So with that, I mean, I enjoyed the film. I thought it was fun. I thought the acting was really good. Uh, Ethan Hawke, who you don't really see as a bad guy, you don't really see as an antagonist. I thought he did a great job, especially since you don't see his face so much throughout the film. He's mostly wearing a mask to conceal his identity from his prey. <laughs> but acting through that, doing it mostly with his voice and his physical mannerisms, I thought he was great. His presence was really strong. Again, trying something different, trying something new, breaking out of his comfort zone a little bit and just achieving a, a good result. So, But I thought the sister and the brother, their relationship was awesome. It was established really well. And the sister is just, she's kind of a scene stealer in this film. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, when you're watching it, if you haven't seen it, the uh, the younger sister, she's she's great. So for the podcast, I watched this for the second time. I really liked it the first time, and I do. I also enjoy Ethan Hawke, and I was like, okay, let's give this a shot. And uh, I enjoyed it, but then like, I I didn't expect the there's a supernatural a aspect to it, and I didn't I didn't get that from the trailer. So I guess I was pretty good that it, that secret was kind of hidden because it was like kind of like a Criminal Minds episode or kind of like a, a Silence of the Lambs uh, true crime style movie. And then all of a sudden this other aspect kicks in and it's like, okay. But now going back and watching it the second time and knowing what's coming, I I enjoyed it, I think, even more this time. And I do agree. The, the, the sister is fantastic. Such a good character, such a good actress. Um, really, you know, you know, really a good performance um, and a beautiful relationship. Um, but I really enjoyed that performance um, probably the most in that film. And I agree, Ethan Hawke, um, the amount that he, he does with his eyes, you know, from an acting standpoint is phenomenal stuff. And I just, you know, and again, going back and seeing it this time, the whole situation with the mask, uh, the, the multiple masks, he wears different ones. The masks are a necessity for him to kind of be a certain thing and do a certain thing. And if he doesn't have it, it's like he he can't function, um, which I think is an interesting aspect of it. But yeah, I, I didn't know that Stephen King's kid uh, made the movie, but the second viewing, I was like, this is very Stephen King. Like, I think I was taken out of it because I wasn't expecting that that supernatural aspect of it the first time. So I wasn't really aware. But then going back and watching this, I was like, yeah, I really got heavy King vibes on that. And that's not a bad thing. But like you said, uh, you know, maybe differentiate yourself. But then also maybe it's just in his blood. You know, maybe these are the kind of stories that he wants to tell. But either way, I thought it was really enjoyable. I like that it's not as divisive as some of the current horror movies that are coming out. If you're either in one of two camps, I'm in the camp where I don't really care for the elevated horror movies uh, so much. But I felt like this was kind of an, I won't say it's not elevated. I, just, I hate that term. I really hate that term. But yeah, but I just overall, it was a, it was a good watch. And if you want to, you know, a, a, a solid story, good acting and a couple scares, and it's a good movie. You should go for it. Yeah, I, I love this movie too. So I was surprised to love it so much because uh, just the, the poster is quite scary. But uh, yeah, I love the story. I think it's, it speaks to, to most of us. Uh, I don't know if it happened in America, but in Europe in the 90s, when I was a child, we had unfortunately many uh, kidnapping cases. So it reminded me of that time, even if I think the story is in the 70s, right? Something like that. The, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I think the the story is um, really realistic. Uh, even if, as you said, is there there is some supernatural things in it, but uh, it makes it natural anyway. And uh, I, I must say that I had a tear at the end because of the relationship between the, the brother and the sister. You had the emotion thing too. Uh, I agree with you with the actors, fantastic actors, especially the, the two kids, uh, fantastic. And Ethan Oak, yeah, I agree with you. He's fantastic in, in that role. He's always fantastic in anything he does. But I don't understand why he, he said yes to this kind of movie because 
we, we don't recognize him most of the time. So it's surprising that such a great actor, I mean, he was already famous. So I, I'm surprised he, he agreed on playing that kind of role when you don't really see his face all the time. So. Well, and I think that's just kind of a testament to like him as a as an actor. Like it's not about having his face on the poster. He doesn't need that kind of um, narcissistic acceptance or relationship with people. Like I believe it's the same director as a film called Sinister that Ethan Hawke was in, and it's the same production company. It's Blumhouse, Jason Blum, and. They reached out to Ethan Hawke and he was like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't really like those kinds of movies. And I don't like being those kinds of characters. They sent him the script and he read the material and he connected with the material and he responded to the material. And that's kind of what brought him in. And the fact that the uh, character he plays is mostly behind a mask, you know, it kind of allows him to maybe separate, separate himself as Ethan Hawke from that character. The mask, it's a very powerful prop for an actor to utilize because it allows them to really disassociate themselves from that character while still, I guess, presenting that character. Totally liberating. I mean, anything, anytime, you know, there, there's, there's something to be said about a challenge of you're playing a normal guy and how do you make that interesting? Sometimes that's, that's a challenge in itself, but then when you get a mask or you get some kind of affliction, you get completely liberated. You can let yourself go and you can become, It's it, it helps you become something else faster. I jump at the chance to play a villain because I never, ever get to play a villain. I think I've played a villain like maybe two times in my life. So for me, it's like, yeah, I want, I'll, I'll be the friend or the love interest or, you know, I'm all these different things, but to play a bad guy, you know, the, you know, that's, you could really sink your teeth into that. And I think for some people, because Ethan Hawke's, you know, he's always the romantic guy or the heartthrob or the, you know, or in a, sci- a sci-fi movie, but to play a, a, a serious, creepy villain, I think most actors would jump at the chance. And to what you said before, Anne, about like, why would he do it? I think it's just that, to prove that he can do it, especially, you know, you're getting older. Why not take a shot? Why not take a chance? Yeah, it could, you know, like... um like there are some really, really fantastic moments between Ethan Hawke and the and the the young boy in the film, mm-hmm. and the psychology of Ethan Hawke's character is very, very interesting. I mean, we could probably do a whole podcast on just the Black yeah. Phone. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time. I will say this about the Black Phone: the one thing that didn't sit right with me was, I guess, the timeline of events. The story takes place in 1978 in northern Colorado, and that's it. That's all you get. Meanwhile, there's a series of abductions that take place, and we don't know if it's weeks. We don't know if it's months. We don't know if it's years. Like, there's no sense of time in this film. And so for me, it was a little distracting because, okay, like, is he just taking these kids back to back to back to back? Because how far does he think he's going to get doing that? You know, usually a serial killer, they'll do their experience, they'll get their high from it, and then that will sustain them for a little while until the next kill cycle begins. And, you know, of course, the more they do it, the shorter that window gets. However, it's something that progresses over time. This seemed to just pop up one day. Okay, a kid's missing. And then shortly after, another kid's missing. And so uh, he accumulates this uh, body count. And we don't really know the time frame other than 1978. So is all this happening inside of that year, inside of that season? Yeah, I agree with you. It's not really clear, but maybe uh, it's kind of a, a subtle information. Like they always refer to the newspaper uh, information. So maybe in the newspaper you have the dates and we didn't really see it, you know. Uh, I don't know. They, they always talk about the newspaper, so maybe. So what I think it is that happens is he gets the kids get abducted. He puts them in the basement. They, he goes through all those tests of will they come up the stairs? Well, you know that type of stuff and how they react. I guess might accelerate his process. So Robin, since he was a tougher kid, probably tried to put up a fight and that accelerated the process and he got 
rid of them. And then I need another one now. And I think then that process starts over. So I think it depends on the child. Mm-hmm. And depends on, it depends on what how they interact with that persona that Ethan Hawke has, that the grabber. It seems like we all really enjoyed the black phone. So I think that one is very highly recommended to anybody who has not seen it. And anybody who has seen it, if you have a different opinion, please send us a message and let us know what you think. After the black phone, we moved into the Sentinel from 1977. And this is a film that came to me through a friend many, many years ago. He was talking about it. I had never heard of it. He loaned me the video. I went home, I watched it. And the one thing that like really stood out about this film that like blew my freaking mind was the cast. This film has one of the most ridiculous casts <laughs> ever assembled. It's like a character actor. It was the Avengers. I mean, <laughs> yeah, Smorgasbord. I mean, from from all eras of film, you know, there's a lot of fresh faces at the time in this movie, a lot of people who were at the start of their career at this point in 1977. And there were a lot of people who were kind of at the end or in the middle of their career. I mean, I'm just going to run off some names here that appear in this movie. It is unreal. You would never see a cast like this today. The closest thing I could think of as a comparison for an ensemble cast of this caliber is true romance. Yeah. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but that also has this just ridiculous cast. But for the Sentinel, we're just going to begin here. Tom Berenger, Christopher Walken, Eli Wallach, who played Tuco in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, amongst other things. Uh, Burgess Meredith, William Hickey, Chris Sarandon, Beverly D'Angelo. Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. It's just it's insane. The amount of people who Jerry Orbach. Jerry Orbach. Yeah, I believe Richard Dreyfus is even a cameo in one of the party scenes. <laughs> it's it's just unreal. And then, of course, the leads are Christina Raines, who isn't a big name, but she's fantastic as the lead actress. And then Chris Sarandon, who, of course, we know from Child's Play as the lead detective, as well as the voice, the speaking voice of Jack Skellington from A Nightmare Before Christmas. Again, amongst other things. Wow. So the first time I saw this movie and I was reading the opening credits, I just I couldn't believe what I was what I was about to see. Martin Balsam from Psycho and uh, 12 mm -hmm. Angry Men. You know, it's it's just it's bananas. I mean, it's really, yeah, really. I, I, I was floored. I was floored by the cast as you were. I mean, this is my first time seeing it and just sitting on the couch and watching those credits. Like, are you kidding me? Like the closest thing I could think of currently that's a cast like that is probably a Wes Anderson film. That's probably yeah. the closest current day. Right. But, but, but even still, you know, um, I think the, the crossroads are a little bit different for the actors involved and yeah. only time will really tell. I mean, looking back at this movie now, 45 years down the road. Wow. And what did you think? I'm sorry, but I didn't like this movie neither. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I agree about the cast. The cast is fantastic. But the movie is super weird for me. <laughs> At least it's really original and atypical. <laughs> the, <laughs> the story is, is really crazy. And the, the characters, um, it's funny because when I watched it, I was thinking about what I said for the during the first episode we, we, we did. Uh, about the nudity. I don't know if you remember that I told you, I don't remember for which movie I told you that maybe in America you're not used to nudity or, or sexual scenes. But in that movie, I was a bit shocked sometimes, I must say. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think it's a very original story, at least that's what I can say. But I didn't really enjoy watching it. And you know, the, the theme, uh, Christianity protecting against evil. I think it's something we we saw so many times, especially in horror movies. So I don't know, I, 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 I wouldn't say it's a bad movie. Definitely, it's not a bad movie, but it's not something that I would like to watch again and again. I watched it once. And uh, as you said, the fantastic actors, uh, I, I have nothing against that. <laughs> it's not something that really entertained me, you know. What exactly was it though that didn't uh, entertain you? Was it was it the story? I mean, like you said, you you enjoyed the actors, the performances were good in your opinion. Everybody did a good job acting wise. 
Yeah, yeah about, about the acting performance, yeah, I, I totally agree with you because really there are some scenes uh, I guess were quite difficult to <laughs> to shoot. Uh, but I, I don't know the... the I don't know the the, the story uh, itself. It's not something that I like to watch. And as I said, uh, some scenes are really embarrassing to watch. I mean, it was really embarrassing for me. And uh, religion, suicide, sexuality, I don't know. It's a bit too much for me. I, I really didn't like the, the, the story itself. Fair enough. Fair enough. That is that is a valid, valid point opinion and point and um steven i'm curious what you had to say because yeah this movie this movie is different (laughs) we will call it that for the most part i enjoyed it just the fact that it was filmed in the 70s automatically has an eerie quality to it oh it's like Mm -hmm. almost any movie from that decade in the in the horror suspense genre it was like a moment in time um Mm -hmm. one thing that i loved was that uh the lead, Christina Raines, I completely bought her as a model. And I know beauty is subjective, but sometimes I'm like, uh, I don't know, would, would five guys be fighting over that girl or that guy or whatever? But this, I felt like she wasn't overly glamorous, but she, I bought her completely without a doubt as a model. So that right there didn't take, because sometimes it takes me out of it. If I don't buy the person as what they're trying to portray pulls me out of it. I completely bought her as a supermodel or as a or as a, a print model. Having said that, one of the things that threw me is when she's having that little flashback episode in the house, and then there's that threesome with the fat lady smearing cake on herself. I'm like, that took a turn. I wasn't <laughs> expecting. I wasn't expecting cake orgy. Um, <laughs> having having said that, I was like, okay. Moving on from that, the dad was just creepy. Like, just, I mean, you couldn't cast a better, you know, I, I don't even want to know what that casting couch looked like. Like, let's see you naked. No thanks. But here's this guy running around with no pants on. And he's, he's like, just frightening, in, you know, as, him, as, as himself. Uh, didn't have to be dead. He just, as a living person in the beginning, frightening. Um, so that was an interesting thing going on. The other thing that stood out to me, and I think this is this, one of the scenes Anne was uncomfortable with, was we see our good friend Beverly D'Angelo um, having a moment. And uh, <laughs> I, I never thought that I would see Ellen Griswold give herself a trip to Wally World on camera. But here we are, and we got it. And it's it's saved you know, for all posterity for the, for, till, till the end of time. That was a little out of pocket and weird. The third one for me was the end when Burgess Meredith and the sea of people are coming towards her, I just got a very Coney Island freak show kind of vibe. I wasn't sure what they were going. Like you have the, the people who are murderers and criminals and then people with actual deformities. And I wasn't sure what the statement there was, if there was a statement, because I'm like, are you saying that these deformed people are just as bad as these murderers? Or I was like, it was just a weird it was just like a, it looked like a freak show, like a Coney Island freak show parade. And I was like, I'm not sure what the aesthetic you're going for here is, but I'm going to have to say this piece is a, that part of it is a fail for me. I just didn't understand why those two things would be put together. Like if I was going to make i I want to make a movie about um, serial killers. And then I just throw in, um, you know, someone in a wheelchair. I'm like, I don't know what that has to do with killers, but okay, that's fine. If you want to go that route. Okay, so here we have a story that is centered around a model, literally a like beautiful, beautiful person in a glamorous profession. Now she's confronted with all of these people who deal with very severe deformities. It's not even that they're ugly. Ugly is, again, a subjective word, but I feel like the people that are being paraded through the climax of the film partially i believe it's a contrast of her lifestyle and her environment and so they're trying to scare her away because she's gravitated towards the glamorous lifestyle and her own natural gifts so now it's kind of like their last ditch effort. Like, let's get rid of her, make her go away. You know, what's going to terrify her? She loves this. Let's show her this. I feel like that's kind of a part of it. And I think they were also supposed to kind of represent like, 
demons, but realistic demons in the sense that like they're, they're these horribly deformed creatures that are coming to get you, you know, and it's not, it's not somebody in like zombie makeup, you know, it's right. not somebody, it's not a creature in a costume that's like, oh, well, whatever, we have to light it a certain way. It's like, no, we're going to put like this really on film. And was it the best decision? I don't think so. Was it the most tasteful decision? I don't think so. But it was a decision and it's committed to film and it's forever. So that's how it is. But I think that's what they were trying to achieve. I think they it was like the last ditch effort of like getting her to not assume the role that she is kind of being groomed for i didn't i didn't think of it that way but no that's a I'll, i'm gonna i'm gonna drink that in um other than that burgess meredith i mean geez i love the guy batman 66 rocky magic the twilight zone grumpy old men you can't go wrong with burgess ever you know he's always fantastic to watch he's always chewing the scenery and I, I'll, I'll watch him do it all day long chris sarandon really cool turn he had that little that cool little mustache, you know, it was, uh, it was fun to see him like that because usually he's like heartthrob baby face type of a guy and like, in, you know, even in Child's Play and in mm -hmm. um, uh, Fright Night especially, he's like that, you know, or, you know, or Princess Bride, you know, take your pick. But yeah, great yeah. ensemble cast. I, I thought had a lot of creepy elements to it, some really good scares. The priest in the window gave me, you know, Mrs. Bates vibes which was always mm -hmm. kind of weird and kind of cool. And just, just that building, just the setting, it was just, I think it had a, a lot, for me, a lot more positives than those three negatives that I mentioned. But to Anne's point, I don't know if I'll go back and watch it again anytime soon. But um, that's not to say that I would never watch it again. Like, I'll probably never watch Barbarian again, but I might revisit it somewhere down the line. Yeah, those those are all good points. I mean, I again, one of the uh, things for me that just makes it intriguing, and I think definitely worth checking out. This film was produced by Universal Pictures. I mean, this is like a big studio film with an incredible cast, but it's kind of forgotten. Like you go and you talk to people about the Sentinel and they don't know what you're talking about, or they think it's a different kind of movie or from a different mm -hmm. era. There's another movie that came out, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago called the Sentinel. And it's a totally different thing. Like, no, the the horror film from the seventies and people, it just does not register. It's like no longer on the radar. You have to go and find this film. It's just not a readily available title like Rosemary's baby or the exorcist or any of those kinds of films. It's really, it's kind of a forgotten gem of sorts for a couple of different reasons. Yeah. I will say that uh, it definitely succeeds in creating an atmosphere and not your typical, necessarily typical horror atmosphere. I mean, it takes place primarily in New York City and specifically in Brooklyn. Um, I've actually been by that house. It's right there on the river. You can you can walk mm -hmm. along and walk past it. It is striking in its presence, and it does have that kind of psycho Norma Bates, Mrs. Bates feeling with the guy in the window um, and, you know, just the big house that's like imposing. It's the house itself is a character in this yeah. film. At the time that I saw this, I was really not a fan of like going to New York City. You know, the the honeymoon was over. The charm had worn off and it was really just it was a chore to go to New York City. However, going to Brooklyn was even worse. Because Brooklyn was like the ass end of the world and everybody wanted to live there. Everybody wanted to move there. And so you had no choice but to go to Brooklyn to see your friends or hang out or go to clubs or go to shows or whatever. Like everything was happening in Brooklyn and it couldn't be further away from where I was personally living at the time. So for me, going to Brooklyn and going to Manhattan was basically like going to hell. <laughs> so... I just had a very strong connection with the uh, the objective of this film. The Sentinel is the guardian of of the gateway to hell. And that's what I saw Brooklyn as at the moment when I first found this film. So I apologize to Brooklyn. I no longer have these feelings. Nevertheless, at the time, that was what I think made it such a strong cinematic experience for me. <laughs> So there you go. That's that's the Sentinel. I mean, I think it's definitely worth watching. So Anne doesn't agree, but I think she might agree that it's worth seeing, maybe not worth keeping. No, no, I, I agree. It's it's worth watching. 
I agree. But I don't really like it. But, you know, sometimes it's interesting to see even if you don't like it, you know, at least I know I don't like it. But it's something that people must see. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that's one of the best things that we're doing here with Shocktober is like it is kind of a mixed bag and everybody hasn't seen everything. So it, that's part of what makes it fun and part of what makes the conversation, I think, interesting as well. And I just again, I love sharing film recommendations with people and I love having having a conversation to just kind of dissect it a little bit because I feel like you get more out of it. Even sure. if you didn't like it, you may get more out of it by having a conversation with people who did like it or who didn't like it if you liked it. So with that being said, the ninth configuration from 1980, this is another one that is just off the wall. It's not yeah. exactly a horror film so much as it is a psychological thriller, but the reason I programmed it was I personally have a very, very strong fondness for this film. And part of it ties into a couple of things I won't get into. But the reason I programmed it was because it was written and directed by William Peter Blatty, who is the author of The Exorcist. And this film is basically the actual unofficial sequel to The Exorcist, insofar as The Exorcist deals with like kind of the dark side of humanity and theology. And this film is the inverse, where you get to kind of see the bright side of humanity and redemption and sacrifice and all of those ideas that, you know, are kind of ingrained in theology and theological ideals. You know, you always have extremes in theology. It's it's heaven or hell. It's black or white. It's God or the devil. And in The Exorcist, you definitely get the dark. In the ninth configuration, I do feel like if you stick with it, it's a journey. They make you work for it. You got to earn it, but you get the light at the end of that tunnel. That was my experience with it, in addition to the ridiculous cast as well. Mm -hmm. It's just phenomenal. Of course, we have uh, Scott Wilson, Stacey Keach, Jason Miller from The Exorcist. Joe Spinell, my personal favorite character actor, pops up. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic casting, again, across the board. And the performances, I feel like Stacey Keach, he delivers in a way that I have not seen before or since in his career. He is just a force of nature in this film. Yeah. I, and uh, uh, Steve? Uh, Ann? And Steve? Steve Ann? Steve Ann! <laughs> <gasps> um... This is my first time seeing it. I've heard of it. Um, didn't know what to expect. I, I thought it was a horror movie because it was on the Shocktober. I'm not upset that it turned out to not be a horror movie. I really enjoyed it for the most part. I thought it was a really good story. You're, you're right. They make you work for it. But if you hang in there, um, I was never bored with it. I, the performances were fucking hilarious at, at certain points. I'm like, this is so good and so off the wall. It gave me uh, feelings of like one flew over the cuckoo's nest meets the green mile. It had like a, a, a nice mixture of like humanity and what's crazy, who's crazy, who's good, who's bad, um, you know, be about the human behavior, the human psyche. I thought there was a lot of good things in there. The only thing I found to be so weird was the, 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 the lead villain in the bar. It was like John Kreese meets, meets Patrick Swayze's character from the Chippendales SNL sketch. It was just wild. And I'm like, this guy's doing a full split the way he just lowered down like an elevator. I was like, this is weird. And then like he kisses him and like, like so there's some pent up homoerotic stuff going on with that guy. That's probably its own movie. I thought the ending was great. Scott Wilson, man. I mean, I've seen him in a couple things here and there. Most notably for me was The Walking Dead. But to see him do something like that, a whole new respect for the guy. I mean, he thought it was a beautiful performance. But yeah, I'm glad you recommended it because I probably wouldn't have watched it had this podcast not been happening. I'm definitely glad that I saw it and I thought there was a lot of good things in there. I'm sure if I go back and watch it a second time, I'll probably pull out things I didn't recognize the first time. Because, you know, you're trying to get a grasp of well, what's happening here. I thought it was a beautiful movie. Yeah, for, for me too. I love this movie, really. Uh, it's uh, mind-blowing. Uh, That's what you say, right? <laughs> so, really, I loved it. Um, 
at the beginning, I saw too many characters. Uh, I was like, okay, I need a paper just to write down the names because there were too many. And I must say that it was really difficult for me to find it. So I was curious to know if it's a famous movie or not. But as you said, Steve, I guess it's not a famous movie. But um, I, I finally find it with a very bad sound in English. So I had to put the subtitles in Spanish. So I practiced my Spanish at least. But if someone knows how to find it in French, I would be cur I would be interested because I really want to share it with my friends. Uh, that's the kind of movie I could watch again and again. Uh, I thought the twist was pretty good. I didn't expect that. So <laughs> really it tricked me uh, until the end. And there is a line I took that I really love at the beginning of the movie. One of the prisoners say, I know my rights. I want to see my urologist. <laughs> I love that line so much. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's the thing with this movie, it starts with a kind of a comedy and it, it goes to a darker story. And uh, that's why I, I really enjoyed it, I think. Uh, everybody can can find uh, some scenes interesting, but the only negative point for me it's what you said the the bar scenes I didn't really like it. It's really the, I think the humiliation is too long for me, and I think the end the I, I won't spoil, but the end is 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 good, but uh, not necessary to say all of it. Um, I know where they wanted to to go. They wanted to to show the the future of one of the the main characters, how it he went, but they could have stopped earlier the movie for me. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, and and I don't disagree. Um, I feel like sometimes it's just it's especially for that kind of a journey that the characters are on to have that closure. It makes it a little bit better for the audience. Let's just mm -hmm. say, you know, and again, it's not for everyone, but it doesn't hurt the film. It's not detrimental to the story or the film. You both mentioned about the uh, the humor in the film. And I found this when I first saw it to be like, what am I watching? Mm -hmm. Honestly, like there are some scenes and there are some lines in this film that are so clever. They are so funny and they are so well executed. You think yeah, like, am I watching a comedy? This is like yeah. bizarre. And then it gets into some really, 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 really heavy psychological, emotional personal situations and that's part of the overall i think idea behind the film is while the exorcist deals with dark themes and dark stories and dark situations dark characters this one there's a humorous element and of course who doesn't like to laugh who doesn't like to have fun even in the midst of the day-to-day -day seriousness that we all deal with so it's kind of almost that like idea of like every cloud has a silver lining of course, people die and there are accidents and there are bills to pay and it's important to laugh. It's important to have fun. And if you have to go a little crazy in the process, well, that's life. I'm glad you guys enjoyed this one. I wasn't nervous, but I was a little curious more so than some of the other films like, gee whiz, I wonder how they're going to take this. <laughs> but again, I, I encourage people to check this one out. Again, it's it's kind of a forgotten gem of a film. And when you when you put it in the the context and the arena of The Exorcist, I mean, The Exorcist 2, forget about that. If you really want to have the experience of the author, I would strongly recommend these two on a double bill, a back to back, because it really gives you that full gamut, that full spectrum of what the author is trying to convey to people through his ideas and through his experiences. And I'll just I'll just add quickly, this is one of the many reasons that I still am a physical media collector is because when these streaming services buy up all these companies and they decide we don't need to ever show that movie again, where is it? It's gone. Mm -hmm. So I, I, if I could find it on a five dollar bin on DVD, I'll, I'll pick it up. I'll take it because, you know, I, I mean, for me, I don't know, Anne, if you have Tubi in France, but that's how I watched it. So I had to watch a couple commercials in between the movies. So it broke up a little bit, but that was the only way I could get a hold of it. So I was like, all right, well, it's this or nothing. So I took that. If I ever see this like in a five dollar bin, I would definitely pick it up and, and just add it to the shelf because again, what if two Bs goes extinct? You know, like some of these other companies have or some of these other programs have. You'll never see some of these. These movies would just be lost, and that's kind of a shame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, then I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. And again, that's a very strong recommendation for the ninth configuration. Again, it's not it's not horror in so much as like blood running down the screen. It's very, very low, but it is very psychological and it's definitely a trip. So buy the ticket, take the ride, let us know what you think. We followed this up with The Babadook or Babadook, Babadook, the book. And this is, again, one of those elevated horror movies that Stephen has a disdain for. Personally, my, my experience with The Babadook, it came out in 2014 and I had heard about it, you know, making the rounds on the festivals and getting a reputation and being distributed. I saw it at a local theater here kind of a small art house theater. I watched it with a buddy and it was okay. And then I didn't watch it for a long time. I saw it earlier this year on a program on the uh, streaming service called Shudder. And on Shudder, there's a show, The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs, drive-in movie critic guy. And he, I, I personally, I love The Last Drive-In and I love Joe Bob. I used to watch him as a kid on Monster Vision on TNT. And he just, he's a great horror host. If you're not familiar with him, go check him out. He's kind of like Elvira or uh, Zachary or Sven Gulli. You know, he's just a person who presents horror films and then puts them into a context and has sort of a discussion. And sometimes there's trivia, sometimes there's history, sometimes there's a social context that they just established. So he's he runs a great program. So I watched it on Shudder, The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob. And the second time I saw it, I'm watching the film and a lot of things in my life had changed between the first time I saw it and the second time I saw it. Most notably, I became a parent. I became a father. And I have two small children now. So watching this movie, I could just see from the get-go that the kid isn't a brat, the kid isn't making trouble, the kid is being a kid, but the kid is also driving his mother fucking insane. <laughs> this lady is no longer the happy, jovial, lovely person, member of society she once was. She is like struggling to keep it together. She is holding on for dear life <laughs> to not lose control. And you can see that from the very beginning of the film when they go looking for monsters before bedtime and all this. And you can just see how tired this woman is because she's a single mother and she's raising a child. And that is probably the toughest job on the planet. It's hard enough when you have a partner. If you're a single parent, I applaud you because it is a job and a half. So watching it a second time, I tapped right into that. And then my perspective on the film completely changed. And I'm sorry to say it, Steve, but it elevated for me. <laughs> I was just seeing this movie in a different light. And when I got to the end, I was like, holy cow, this movie is incredible. Wow, what a way to present a story. So we watched it on Thursday and a buddy of mine who had never seen it and my wife, they watched it. They had never seen the film. And my wife tapped into the, the mother son dynamic right away because of obvious reasons. But my buddy who's not married, who doesn't have kids, he was kind of, you know, he was into it for like the, uh, the atmosphere and the thematic elements. And the, of course I would probably lose my tongue if I didn't mention the lead actress S.C. Davies, the movie's wa worth watching simply for her performance. I mean, the fact that she didn't like scoop up every award on the planet is beyond me because she just runs the gamut of emotion and of character arc, let's just call it for now. But yeah, S.C. Davies, The Babadook, that is a masterclass in acting right there. If you like, if I had to like, talk to aliens about what what a performance is i would cite her performance as an example because it is just off the chart but my buddy he watched the movie and he kind of had a similar experience to my first experience where it's like okay well yeah whatever but then we watched it and joe bob gave his analysis and i told him like i basically agree with everything this man is saying before the fact 
And he was like, oh, dude, that movie was sick. Oh, I totally get it. It's definitely a movie I feel you need to watch more than once in order to fully appreciate. And I probably should have just said that instead of my big tangent. So maybe I'll edit it out. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm curious what your experience was because you and I actually had a conversation while you were in the middle of watching it. And I want to know what your takeaway from this film was, especially as, as a woman, you know, as somebody who can definitely connect with the main character, you know, you can't always like Steve and I, we can connect with Bruce Willis and Die Hard because we're men, you know, (laughs) Uh, it's, it's a little bit harder for us to connect with a female character and a female actress, because you guys have different experiences in life. And so I want to know what you think about this character, this actress, this performance, this story. Okay. Um, so first of all, I, I wanted to say that I, it's, it's the movie I really wanted to see this week. Uh, I think I, I said that uh, last week, but uh, yeah, it's an Australian movie and directed by a woman. I think it's the, the first movie we watched during October uh, directed by a woman. Uh, I'm not sure there are many uh, women directors doing horror movies. I don't know. I'm just saying. Uh, and I think you you can feel it that it's done by a woman. I don't know. I, I felt that like it was more focused on the feelings and the relationship between the kids and, and the mother than you can find in other movies. That's the way I felt. But um, I agree with you. AC Davis is fantastic, really. Um, but it's funny that you related to, to the mother because when I watched the movie, I related to the kid, probably for personal reasons, but um, because the, the movie is about grief, right? Uh, if I understood it well, the, the father died the day that the kid was born. So, and it happens a bit the same thing in my family. I mean, I, I still have my both parents, but someone died just uh, before I, I got born and I, I got the name of this person. So. I related to the kid for many reasons, but um, yeah, I agree. This movie is really, it's 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 awesome. It's something really you need to watch again and again. You can watch it many times. I watched it twice, actually. Um, I, I loved it. It's super creepy. It's a, <laughs> a perfect movie for October. It's a, definitely a horror movie. So don't watch it at night if you don't want to make nightmares. Um, but there are a few things I didn't really get why they were in the story. For example, I, I hope I'm not spoiling too much, but um, she has kind of a, a the start of a relationship with one of her colleagues and uh, he comes to her house. So you think that something's going to happen with this guy, but actually nothing happens. So I was a bit confused about this character, to be honest. The same with um, the fact that she's surrounded by sick people. She's uh, She's kind of a nurse. Uh, in a, I think, Alzheimer uh, hospital, I don't know, a, a place with Alzheimer people. And the neighbor has Parkinson. So I thought something's going to happen with sick people, but no, uh, I, don't, I don't really get why it was part of the story, actually. That's something that confused me. The main character works, her name in the movie is Amelia, and she works at a uh, basically like a retirement home. So there are a lot of elderly people. Some of them have Alzheimer's or dementia or some type of debilitating disease. And then her neighbor has Parkinson's disease. I think part of having those elements in the story is again, like with the Sentinel, they're trying to make a connection between people. And so without spoiling too much, and if you're afraid of that, then I strongly suggest you stop the podcast right now and go watch the film and then come back to us. But she has herself a mental problem. She is dealing with grief and her stuff is hidden inside and it manifests as the Babadook. Like there is no Babadook. The Babadook is the monster inside of her. It's the grief inside of her. And she's the one who wrote the book. I don't know if you remember, she's at that party with those ladies and she's like, oh yeah, I did some things for some magazines and I used to write stuff for children. Like that's kind of a clue. She wrote the book and it looks homemade. That's that's part of the uh, the thing about the book is like, yeah, like you don't get this on a shelf. The kid finds it. Like that's kind of almost her grief diary, like exercising her own demons. And as the story progresses and the movie progresses, 
the book gets more pages and it continues to, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate foreshadowing end, which may or may not actually happen. Let's let's leave some things to mystery. <laughs> She's surrounded by these people with these debilitating disorders to kind of also show that, yes, OK, they obviously have a problem, but other people who seem normal also have problems and just because you can't see it or it isn't apparent doesn't mean that it's not there and everybody is dealing with their own their own problems so i think that's part of why they specifically had those elements there as far as the love interest goes i think it's also it's just it's another it's another hurdle i mean of course she is an attractive woman she is a single parent, a single person. Clearly the man is okay with the boy, even though the boy comes off as a little strange or strong personality, but he's trying to connect. And I just feel like it's, again, it's to show the level of grief that Amelia is going through. She's still dealing with the loss of her husband, so she can't move on to these relationships that are there waiting for her. She can flirt and have like these little comments here and there around the workplace, but when the guy shows up, she's so involved with the relationship of her child and what she's been dealing with, what's been growing for the past six years since his birth, seven years, that she can't even see past it. She can't see past her grief to what's available to her. And it's only through the process of the film and when we get to the end, when the kid is finally able to celebrate his actual birthday, that you feel like, okay, maybe she's turned a corner and maybe life is an option for her again, you know? Yeah, but... It's they could have explored more the character, like what you just said, for example, for the birthday party, he could have been invited. Yeah, he could have. And for all we know, he was. We don't. We don't know because the movie just kind of concludes. And that's... that's. Yeah, we don't know, but uh, you know, it would have been more obvious to... Yeah, okay. Right. But is is that the most important part of the story? Is that... Like, why are you watching a love story and you want to see these two get together? Or do you want to see the mother not kill the no. son? <laughs> it's always good to have a love story around, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think we got our, our happy ending after the, uh, the dark, dark journey. Steven, have you seen this one before? I have not seen this one. I kind of avoided it. When I first saw the trailer nine years ago, I was a bit intrigued because I'm like, I like horror movies. Um, and I thought the Babadook as a character had a pretty cool look, very unique, nothing we've seen before. And I'm like, all right, I kind of dig this. And then it got labeled with that elevated horror thing. And then I was like, I'm going to avoid it like the plague. I have mixed feelings about the film, but they lean more towards the positive. Out of all of the current elevated horror movies that I've seen, I... I think I like this one the best in that I think it's kind of the most effective in what it's trying to accomplish. But that's not to say that I agree with everything that it's done. I just want to jump in for a second for people who may not be familiar with the term elevated horror. We keep throwing it around. Uh, elevated horror is basically a term that people who don't normally like horror movies have applied to horror movies <laughs> so they can feel good about liking them. Um, it's kind of a bullshit term. I personally don't use it. It's horror. That's it. But elevated horror is something that maybe is a little bit more artistic or a little bit more cerebral in its presentation. And so people like to assign it to films, especially films that they want you to like. Personally, I don't believe in it, but for an example, um, Silence of the Lambs that won Oscars would be considered an elevated horror film because it has a certain kind of reputation and pedigree. It's a horror film. It's a damn good one, but because it won awards, it's elevated. And that's kind of the idea behind what we're talking about with the Babadook. It's a little bit artistic. It's not your typical conventional one. And I feel that it's just a good horror film. But Elevated Horror, Steve, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, with that too, I think for some people, the elevated term means that there's a little more substance to it than just some 
unkillable monster slashing girls in you know in a campground yeah. or whatever. But right off the bat, I had a problem with the kid. Didn't like the kid. And I have four kids, and I'm like, this kid needs discipline. And I have a big problem with that. That kid has no father, so yeah, he needs well, well, yes. a strong male role model. Well, and a companion to take some of the weight off of the mother's shoulder. So yeah, he he lacks discipline. <laughs> and I don't and I don't disagree with that because I then that's the thing that I'm I'm fighting with now as I'm watching this. I'm like, I don't know what it's like to be a single parent. Moreover, I don't know what it's like to be a single mom. However, when you're watching the film and she takes a hard stance with him on certain things and she puts her foot down, you see the instant behavior change. So to me, it's like I go back and forth with those things because it's like while she is grieving you got to show up for the kid you know and i guess that's the point she's not really showing up for her life she's not showing up for her relationships i got that the grief manifested itself as the babadook and that was her you know like the more you deny it the stronger it gets and all that kind of, that was a very clever uh thing to do her performance is fantastic she went from being completely sympathetic to being downright fucking scary at certain parts of this like you know even her her, her voice change and you like you know, singers will know this. It's not something you just do in your throat. Like you felt it come from like her diaphragm from her core. And that was a very impressive thing to see. My other problem with the elevated horror thing is I'm starting to delve into them now because I'm in the middle of writing a, a, a horror movie with a friend of mine. And so now I have to know what's out there, right? I have to be educated about this, the current thing. So I'm, I'm diving into these movies. And the one thing that's kind of annoying, I think, is like you said, it's a horror movie. I'm going to watch a horror movie. I expect to see a horror movie. Now, I don't need it to be a bloodbath from start to finish. I don't want that either. But with some of these films, I found it to be, okay, the first hour of this movie is this really intense, you know, gut-wrenching family drama. And then the filmmaker looks at his watch and goes, oh, shit, we have a half an hour left. Let's throw some, just throw some scares and some kills in there. And I feel that's what happens. I feel like in the elevated realm the drama is taking the driver's seat in this horror film where I feel like if you could find a way to, I don't mind having these messages about grief and loss and all these other things inside of these movies. That's fine. I actually welcome that. But if you could find a better happy medium where it's not like the first two acts of the movie are just a, just a, oh, this is a heavy drama. And then all of a sudden you start scaring us. It's like, can we just figure out a way to mix that together so it's nice and evenly planned out? And I feel like, this because some some people cite the Babadook as the beginning of the elevated horror genre. Not all people, but some people. Um, and I can see that, but I feel like this was successful in a better blend. I still feel this was a little more heavy on the drama. I would have liked a, a touch more horror mixed in, a little more Babadook, I guess you could say. But overall, I found this one to be more digestible for my sensibilities than the other ones that I've seen. No, in, in what you just said, I just wanted to take the, the defense of this little boy. <laughs> because um, what I see is that this kid... When he got born, there was a, a significant death in his family, his father for his particular case. And I think it questions your existence in life. And this little boy is restless because it's his it's way of expression. And I agree with you that maybe his mother should have done something, but she's overwhelmed by the grief and everything. So that's why I related to, to this kid, because you can understand why he's so active and uh, he has such imagination because that's the way he can express that he's, he's here for a reason, you know? So I, I, I disagreed with what you said <laughs> about this kid, but for the rest, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just a, I'm a stickler for the discipline thing, but, but you know, to what you said, I, I did then feel for him though, like when he turned the corner and he started to say, you know, I'll, I'll protect you if you protect me. Like, okay, I can get on board with that, you know. Like so, I started opening up to him more, but they they put him in such a position in the beginning, I think, where he looks like such a little pain in the ass, and it's like, oh my god, no wonder. And I, I to what Pete had said originally is that, yeah, as a parent, you get run down. Like like they, like, there's only so many questions you could answer in a day from a toddler, you know, or you know, you've drained every possible answer every you know I, I just i've got nothing left to offer you so go to bed i love you i'll see you in a couple hours and we'll start again tomorrow i think that's also part of the misdirection 
um, to kind of get people a little off balance, you know, yeah, like you're, you two specifically, this is interesting because you're, you're sort of divided, like Anne sympathizes with the little boy. Steve is team mom. And that's, that's part of like the miss, the misdirection. Again, I feel like Steve, I I'm very curious to know what your experience is with a rewatch and you don't have to rewatch it now but give it some time, let it digest, and then go watch it again. Because again, sometimes, and I think I talked about this with Anne earlier this week, you watch a movie and then you go back to it after a little bit of time and you already know the road you're going down, but you get to see different signposts. You get to see different things throughout that journey that maybe make sense a little bit more or maybe point out certain things like, especially with the Babadook, when you get to the end, okay, fine. Yeah, whatever. But if you go back to the beginning, then you have this like map of where you're going and you can see all of these little instances where no, the horror is there from the beginning and it's growing and it's manifesting until finally it pours out of the characters. The first time you watch it, you you kind of are just like taking the ride. But the second time you watch it, you really kind of get to like explore the world and look at like all the different elements of the frame because you're not paying attention to the character talking. You can kind of let your eye or your mind drift around the story and the setting, and it just makes it a different kind of experience. So I am. Um, this is one that I actually considered buying. So mm-hmm. I, I don't. I don't rush. I used to rush out and buy all new movies. Money and space on the shelf has become, uh, you know, there's a constraint on both of those things. So now it's like, eh, you got to really impress me or I got to really like it because, you know, I'm pushing like a thousand movies and DVDs and Blu-rays and all that stuff. So it's like, I got to yeah. really pick and choose. And I, I actually considered buying this one to give it another watch. Well, and that's an interesting point too, because again, the writer writes the movie and they develop it over however long a period of time. And then the director comes along and they make the movie and they've already worked with it for however long a period of time. And sometimes in this case, especially it is the writer director is the same person. So already you as an audience member, you're coming in from the cold into this, this house that's been built by this person and they know every nook and cranny. They know all the cracks and all the secret passages and everything. And you kind of just have to find your way around this new structure, this new thing, and you can't possibly know it as well as they do. So they're making the movie that they see, that they want, that they've developed. And there's all these layers, all this nuance that they've wanted there from the beginning. And so as an audience member who was not a part of that creative process whatsoever, yeah, sometimes you cannot really dissect a film based on an initial viewing. You know, it's it's like, I agree, you should at least like or dislike a movie based on a viewing. And there should be something there that attracts you to it. Personally, I love rewatching movies, especially if I like them, because I like to dig deeper. But if I don't like a movie, I don't think a second viewing is going to change that. Like, it's either going to be okay, and I'll watch it again at some point, I don't know when, or no, the movie's bad for a number of reasons, which I will now share with you in detail. And that's it. And you're not going to change my mind because these are my thoughts. These are my feelings based on my life and my experience and my education and whatever. But I feel like, yeah, like rewatching a movie, I personally, I really enjoy it, especially if I liked it. You know, if, if, if I didn't like it and I had to rewatch it, like you had to with barbarian, it's a chore and I appreciate you indulging me, but it was great to have like a fresh conversation. Like there are a number of movies that people like that I don't like, and I will not watch them again unless I have to, if only to defend my position of not liking it. Like I'll remember what I didn't like (laughs) as I'm watching it. Yeah. I think it's good. I think it's definitely worth at least one watch. I think it's worth two. And yeah, I agree. I watched it twice and, and I loved it. The Babadook, I think Anne and I and Steve were in agreement. It's definitely worth a watch. Watch it twice. Um, and I feel like as time passes, it's going to be kinder to this film. I think this is one that's going to be sticking around in the genre for a while. It's not a flash in the pan, as they say. We'll be probably talking about the Baba Duke for years to come because it's already been nine years and the Mm -hmm. film still has 
an allure. You know, there's a lot of people like Anne who was looking forward to it and Steve who avoided it, but was sort of looking forward to it, but was avoiding it. Check it out if you haven't. If you have, let us know what you thought. But now we moved on to Suburban Screams and Steve only watched the first episode. I watched the first two and didn't watch any. But the reason I selected this series was because it's produced by John Carpenter, who is a heavyweight in the genre. And the promotion behind this series was it's kind of his return to directing. It's his return to horror. He's been doing a lot of music lately. He hasn't really directed anything in over a decade. And, you know, I watched the first two episodes, neither of which were directed by John Carpenter. I don't know. For me, I'm just going to talk about the first episode with Steve, and then we'll talk about John Carpenter as a whole, because I think we can all relate to the greatness of John Carpenter as a filmmaker and as a kind of pioneer in the contemporary genre of horror. But Suburban Screams, first episode it's okay it has a an unsolved mystery vibe basically it's taking interviews with people who experience some type of supernatural or horrific uh situation in their life and then it's dramatizing it so there is a um i almost want to say like amateurish student film quality about it I feel like they should have maybe done a little interview segment that sets it up and then go into a very polished like retelling of the story and then bookended it with the conclusion of the actual survivors, let's just say. I feel like that would have been maybe a better presentation for it and utilized actual news footage or headlines or settings in the retelling. I feel like it's a victim of the the content wars and John Carpenter is for all intents and purposes he's he's just retired. <laughs> it didn't necessarily feel like a John Carpenter product the way we understand a John Carpenter product and I mean of course through his films um, through his body of work, films like Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York, the list goes on and on. The Thing, I think I'd rather talk a little bit about some of his other films right now. Before we get into that, Steve, do you agree? Do you have anything to add to the Suburban Scream summation? To your point about saying that it's a victim of the content wars, I completely agree. It was not enough of one thing. Or, you know, so like you said, use some footage, use some actual, you know, documentarian skills, or then do a very polished retelling. It wasn't a strong enough dramatic reenactment, and it wasn't a strong enough documentary piece. It fell somewhere in the middle, and it kind of fell a little flat. I started the second episode, but I just, I passed out. I just couldn't. I just fell asleep. I was way too tired. Was it horrible? No, but you know, there are better ways to spend 45 minutes. Yeah, for sure. I didn't really see or feel too much John Carpenter in this series, which was one of the reasons I wanted to check it out. And I haven't found that yet. The last time I really experienced a John Carpenter film would have to be In the Mouth of Madness. That is the high water mark. That is his last great film. That is the last time he was really in his element. Everything after that is just kind of rolling downhill. I mean, there's some fun stuff in there, but really in the mouth of madness is is where that that book ends. That's like the final chapter in a pretty fantastic run of horror films and a uh, career. And you watched In the Mouth of Madness in place of Suburban Screams. What was your experience with In the Mouth of Madness? I would say a disturbing movie. <laughs> Uh, really interesting. I don't really know John Carpenter, Carpenter to be honest with you. Um, I watched Escape from New York, and before that, I did. I just knew the name of the director, but I didn't really know about him. Um, so I didn't really know what to expect. And um, I went to my DVD rental uh, store again, and uh, when I asked for a John Carpenter movie, to he told me it's one of the best one in the mouth of madness. I don't know what you think about it, but yeah, it's a disturbing movie. Maybe I should explain the story. I don't know. Well, we don't want to ruin it for Steve, okay. but I'm curious. Did you enjoy the film? Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed the film. And that's the kind of movie you want to rewatch. Uh, after you just watched it but um yeah for me it's kind of a a scan of our society you know uh, it's about uh, fanatism and uh, 
it's a bit of a, a um, Mulder and Scully, you know, one believes in, in reality, the other one believes in what's not believable and uh, they, they fight until the end and at the end you're, you're completely disturbed about what's real and what's not. But uh, yeah, it's really interesting and it's really well shot. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, star Sam Neill, who most people don't realize just how strong Sam Neill's horror pedigree is. Everybody knows him from Jurassic Park as Dr. Alan Grant, but he was in In the Mouth of Madness. He was in Event Horizon. He was in the Omen sequel. He was in Possession. I mean, Sam Neill is really a horror actor. It's it's pretty fantastic. And he really shines in this film. This is another one that has one of those ridiculous ensemble casts. You just see all these great character actors come together. Charlton Heston is in this movie. Okay? Moses. Ben-Hur is in In the Mouth of Madness. So take that to the bank, all right? This film also has a very, very, very strong H.P. Lovecraft foundation and inspiration. When you watch it, you'll understand. And if you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about, especially if you've read any Lovecraft works. But In the Mouth of Madness, high watermark. Let's just leave it there. Steve, you actually went to see The Thing this week at the Alamo Draft House in the theater, big screen. I'll say something blasphemous. I always felt that The Thing was overrated. Now, I like it. I own it. I actually own two copies of it. But when I watched it on the big screen, I was wrong. It's awesome. Like, I don't know what it was about watching on the. It definitely enhanced the experience for me. I knew everything that was going to happen because I've seen it a bunch of times. I remember some of the dialogue, but something about seeing it on the big screen really kicked it up a notch for me. And if you get a chance to see it on the big screen, that's how I would recommend you seeing it because it's not a big movie, but it's a big movie. Like the effects, the just the overall atmosphere, the events that take place in the film, it's kind of big. So I, I think if seeing it on a big screen really sold it for me and while i don't think it's his best movie and that's a point of contention for a lot of people my for personal favorite is halloween i think that's his best film but i think this is you know thing is definitely top five for him i totally agree that seeing it in the theater is a different experience i myself have caught a number of films that i was very familiar with in the theater over the years and it is just game changing it really, really is in terms of how you think of the film and how you experience the film. I actually did see The Thing in the movie theater a few years ago as part of an Apocalypse Trilogy screening at the Alamo Draft House, and it was they were all 35 millimeter prints. So I, it was basically like I was watching this movie opening weekend in 1982. It was such an incredible experience. And again, seeing it not only on the big screen, and in the theater with the surround sound experience and the theatrical mix, these films, especially older films, they were made to be seen in the theater. They were not made to be seen streaming. They were not made to be seen on your phone or on your television or on your computer. They were made to be seen on like a 40 foot screen, basically the side of a building, you know, no peripheral vision. You are in a dark room watching this. This is like your life. This is your experience for this amount of time. And that in and of itself elevates the experience of the horror. So, I mean, that's that's elevated horror right there, is seeing a movie, a good movie, in the theater because you are actually having an experience. I was sad when it was over, and I knew the end was coming. I was like, over already? <laughs> but to, very quick story to your point. I had seen the original Alien a bunch of times, and I, I really enjoyed that movie. I had never seen Aliens, ever. And then... Five or six years ago in Manhattan, they were doing a screening of Aliens. And after it, Sigourney Weaver came out for a Q&A. And so the first time I ever saw Aliens was on a big screen. And then Sigourney Weaver came out and saw it. So I think my not seeing it was well worth the wait of seeing it on the big screen with a, with a theater full of people. And when she came out, people just lost it. And it was like that made my wait so much more worth it in the end because like that was a cool movie. So seeing it on the big screen, seeing something on the big screen really helps a lot of the time. It's it's very interesting that you uh, mention your experience with Alien because Anne actually watched all four Alien movies this week 
at my house, we played the alien board game Fate of the Nostromo, and it was a lot of fun. We're definitely going to play it again. And while we were playing it, we threw on the original movie just to have the the ambiance and the characters and kind of help illustrate some of the points and experiences of the characters in the movie as reflected in the game. I thought it was a really cool game. It was a lot of fun. It was very, very hard. So we lost the alien won. <laughs> And in watching the original film last night, it's a beautiful film. It's uh, Ridley Scott's second film after uh, The Duelists, which coincidentally stars co-stars Christina Raines from The Sentinel. But Alien is very different from Aliens, which is very different from Alien 3, which is also very different from Alien 4. So this is kind of like almost like a, uh, what's the word after triathlon? It's a quadrathlon. <laughs> Help me out. <laughs> Oh, it is definitely a marathon of endurance and mm -hmm. different terrain. So, Anne, Alien, Aliens, Alien Three, Alien Resurrection. Overall, how do you how do you feel about the series? First of all, I survived <laughs> because for me, as a, someone who doesn't like horror movies, it was a, a big thing. The only thing I knew about this saga first was. Sigourney Weaver, I know she was the main character of it. And it was about a big bug. That's all I knew about it. So <laughs> it was a, such an experience <laughs> to watch the four movies. You told me, if, I, if I'm right, you told me that uh, the, the, the most appreciated ones is Aliens by James Cameron, right? That's what you told me. I had mentioned that a lot of people consider Aliens, directed by James Cameron, to be the best of the bunch and in some cases superior to the original. Wow. Once again, I have an unpopular opinion. Yeah, because for me, it's the worst one. <laughs> I really didn't like it. Uh, and the one I... <laughs> Sorry, I told you I have an unpopular that is, that is now, very, very Now we've lost cabin hang pressure. Hang on, hang on. Yeah, now the gloves are coming off. <laughs> As a feminist, what uh, irritated me the most in this movie is the cliche between uh, the, the little girl who can only be managed by the woman, the, by replay. Because apparently when you're a woman, you can manage a kid and uh, men can't do it. Uh, really, I, I, it's really irritated, <laughs> irritated me. Um, and I would say that th this movie, for me, it's exactly the same as Ridley Scott in a longer way. It's, it's a deja vu, you know, it's the same story. She's against uh, the, the, uh, the team. Everybody thinks she's stupid, but actually she's the smartest one and she's going to be the only one to survive. That's exactly the same story in a longer way. Because James Cameron, apparently, he can't, he can't make a movie less than two hours. <laughs> well, that's, that's true. We can't deny that. See, I watched Alien 3 and 4 one time and then never again. I don't even own them. I chose not to buy them on purpose. And I love Fincher. I'm a massive Fincher fan, but I, 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 I just can't watch Alien 3 again. That's funny what you say, because Alien 3 is actually my favorite one. Really, I love David Fincher and... <laughs> Now we lost cabin pressure. <laughs> uh, we I are off the rails, people. Holy I, smoke. I never in my wildest dreams ever thought I would hear anybody say that sentence. My mind is officially blown. I think my brain is dripping out of my ear. <laughs> Holy cow. I mean, for me, the best thing to come out of that movie is that iconic image of, you know, the xenomorph and her face to face with it drooling. I mean... That's so it's so funny because that movie is regarded as one of the worst, but that image, like it, it almost is as big as the franchise. I agree. For me, the third, uh, the third movie is the um, the one with the deepest meaning. So yeah, because you have the kind of a value inversions um, because she she's with uh, prisoners, you know, so she's among rapist criminals, but she's gonna save them. And those guys who killed women and rape women, they need her her to to be saved. So they they become the victim, you know. So I think it was really interesting and to to feel empathy for criminals at the end of the movie. I really felt empathy for them. So yeah, for me it's a masterpiece this movie, <laughs> and especially the end. Uh, I think it was the perfect ending for the saga. 
So I was a bit disappointed when I when you told me that there, there was uh, another movie after that, because really the end was perfect. I don't want to spoil anybody, but um, yeah, the, the end was really great. And you have funny lines in that, in that movie, because with the prisoners, you, ha you have funny interactions, things you don't really have, I think, in, in the other movies. And um, I would say, last but not least, you have a love story in that one. <laughs> And that's the only moment Ripley has a love story. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Pump your brakes there a moment. And okay, first of all, I love everything you just said about three. And I might actually even go watch three again with that idea in mind. Because for me, I remember when Alien 3 came out. I remember when Alien 4 came out and like my experience with it is kind of all jumbled and across many, many years. And over the course of those years, and I believe Steve will agree with me, you have a relationship with the story, you have a relationship with a character, you have a relationship with a film, and then you revisit it and that relationship becomes stronger. So for us, right, we saw Aliens and then Alien 3 came out. And the first thing that you see in Alien 3 is that Newt and Hicks and Bishop basically are gone, obsolete, kaput, goodbye, the end, game over, man, game over, okay? <laughs> so for us as fans of the film and the characters and the franchise, it was just, it was kind of almost like a dismissal slap in the face. We were so pumped and excited to see the continuation of aliens with those characters and again i'm sorry Anne, but there was something going on with hicks and ripley there was chemistry there you know and i really wanted to see where that went and they took that from me <laughs> i'm never going to get it back i wanted to see where the story went with hicks and ripley and even newt and they took that from us like a thief in the night. They just <laughs> took it and ran and we never saw him again. Again, I saw aliens, aliens late, later than you, but I still watched them in order. So, yeah. So when those characters are just dismissed, like what just happened? Like I was already, I, I'm already angry. You like, there's no one doing that now. And then like going into it, me being such a Fincher fan, knowing he hates that movie and how much, meddling the studio did kind of had like a perverse it was like oh, well, I'm, I'm probably not gonna like this because there's constraints on him he can't just do what he does i saw the theatrical cut i've never seen his cut so it's like ugh, i don't know i just didn't enjoy it but you know i will say you know i agree with you pete Anne's evaluation of the film makes me want to go back and give it another shot but i think i might have to go back and give it a shot with the director's cut this time um with aliens i I don't know, Anne. <laughs> I mean, we're still friends and everything, but gee whiz, I gotta, I gotta like, I need some time with this. You know, I need to process everything that's been conveyed here. There's a definite line between one and two and three and four. The cohesion for me wasn't there. Plus, it just felt like, let's just make some more money. Let's just keep inventing, invent, and, and, and not even like clever inventing. For the fourth Alien Resurrection, I would say it's it's kind of a mix between the one and two. Uh, as of the story, you know, they they put a, an android back with Winona Ryder. Um, yeah, I, I didn't like this character, but anyway, um, and they tried to make something like the first story, but they um, they tried to to make something kind of new with heavy themes like um, cloning. And uh, I felt like maybe they wanted to talk about um, surrogate mothers. I don't know. I, maybe I think too much, but I felt like, um, you know, Replay, she, she feels involved with her kid uh, as a surrogate mother. So I thought maybe it was a, something, a, a theme they wanted to, to talk about also in this movie, but sometimes I think too much. So I don't know. It is a very interesting perspective that you shared today. And I really, really, really do sincerely appreciate you taking the time to watch all four of them to talk about them. So to recap, Dark City, 
Matrix meets Labyrinth, Try to Find the Director's Cut, The Black Phone, unanimous, everybody enjoyed, although it has its opportunities and it's very, very reminiscent of The King, but that is because it's in the same gene pool. The Sentinel was a mixed mixed experience, but we're all agreed that it's worth watching and the cast is something you will probably never see again. Ninth Configuration was a surprise for everyone involved and again, totally worth watching. The Babadook is worth re-watching for a number of reasons because it's it's just so elevated. You can't you can't get to that level on the first try. Uh, Suburban Screams is a sort of just namesake of a horror icon, but his back catalog is still strong as ever and worth watching. And I mean, honestly, yeah, of all the horror filmmakers in history, John Carpenter has one of the strongest filmographies that aged exceptionally well. And Alien, it depends on what side of the planet, what time zone you're in. You could (laughs) see different things at different times of your life. I feel like Alien, it has such a strong foundation from the first film that if they put out Alien 5, I would watch it. And did you have fun with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fun to watch, of course. And it's so iconic that I wanted to watch it. But um, yeah, I, I knew that I wouldn't have the same opinion on, as you. Maybe it's not a, a cultural thing. Maybe it's a gender thing. Maybe. I don't know. And I'm not going to have the surgery to find out. So <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. I do think we will be revisiting Alien, Aliens, the franchise later on down the line in this podcast series, because I guess I'll just take this opportunity to announce that beginning in November, along with the podcast, we will be doing a film recommendation series on our YouTube channel called Visually Hidden Selects, where I share some of my recommendations of films that I've enjoyed over the years or that have had an influence or inspiration to me as a filmmaker and what we do here at Visually Hidden. So you'll be getting some analysis and hopefully I can maintain a spoiler-free recommendation, but I encourage everybody to check that series out and then come into the podcast for our uh, discussion on those films. And with that, I'm going to say this has been a monster of an episode, and I look forward to next week. Next week, we have a number of things beginning today with the Twilight Zone movie, and then we have a wild card followed by The Menu. House Buried is, of course, on there. Then we have the last drive-in Halloween special, which I don't think anybody else is going to be able to see unless you have Shutter, so you can throw that in as a wild card. And then we have an X-Files night for next Saturday. So, Steve, what are you looking forward to the most this week? Um, Well, two. The Twilight Zone movie, because I've never seen it. And I was thinking about watching the menu anyway this season, so I'm like, all right, let's get to it. Very cool. And what are you, what are you looking forward to this week? The Twilight Zone, because I I don't know about it. I mean, I I know the name of it, but uh, yeah, that's something iconic, so I really want to watch it. Yeah, the Twilight Zone movie is one that I grew up with. We'll talk about that extensively next week, because not only is that a movie, but it's an anthology movie. So there are like, I don't know, four stories, four and a half stories in that film. So we'll dig deep next week. I myself, I'm looking forward to the menu, of course, because I have not seen it. Uh, that's about it for this, this episode. I want to thank Steve for taking the time to watch everything and sit in with us and provide some commentary. And of course, for going the extra mile and digesting the entire Alien franchise, in addition to all of the films this week, above and beyond, Anne, (laughs) above and beyond. Um, you can catch Steve on Instagram at Steve's Pop Culture Corner. And of course, Anne and I are uh, on Letterboxd and you can see what we've been watching and see what we think over there. Until next week, this is Peter O'Brien and Visually Hidden saying, see ya. <laughs> <laughs>